Good morning. Good morning. Our last morning together. Okay. I'm running out of a few the prayers that I brought with. I should have brought more, but uh, okay. Ready? How can this happen, Lord? Just when I think I am filled with faith and all things are as they should be in my life, something happens. And within seconds, doubt erupts inside of me, and I'm asking you, how can this happen? And I fully expect an answer. But what is it that I really expect to hear from you? Time and again, I've reflected upon other moments or days in my life when doubt has taken hold of the wheel of my reality like some bold teenager. I review how I cycled through panic along with a few sleepless nights and prayed for an explanation. How can this happen? I wonder how many times I've asked that question of you. I can truthfully say that you have never once given me a direct response, but you have responded. I can also truthfully say that. Your silence forces me to wait, to observe, to come to the realization each time that I am not in charge of all the countless events that come together in every second that make up the journey of my life much less the lives of others. I'm not in charge of anything. Your silence has allowed me to observe changes unfolding in the lives of others and not just my own. How can these and other events happen without you consulting me? They happen because they must. Change clears debris. Change moves us forward. Change is the nature of life. Lord, I know I am going to panic again and again, and I will ask that question of you again and again. At least remind me when I do that each time that life moves on, rebirth happens, and joy always returns. That is your promise. Amen. Okay. We have work to do this morning. <coughs> you know how I set up these prayers. The name of my book is The Power of Holy Language. And so the first part of it is discussions on prayer and holy language. And, but then the second part is a hundred prayers. And among them, the ones that I've shared with you. But how I set it up is after the prayer is a piece of guidance based on the prayer and then a selection of grace based on the prayer and the guidance. So each prayer, every page is the prayer, guidance, and grace because that's the subtitle of the book, The Power of Holy Language, Prayer, Guidance, Grace. So now I'm going to talk to you about what words to perhaps reinstate in your soul's vocabulary as power holy language. We, you know, we've talked about the, oh, you know, I wish this thing would just step aside, step here, step there, <laughs> but it doesn't have a mind of its own. Um, in a sense, I need to have you for a year to kind of reprogram you so you have to put yourself on fast forward and, and one of the what I, I, I want to emphasize is that you are never striving for perfection you're just striving for awareness and to bring yourself back to center to always bring yourself back to center to to realize every day we're gonna we're going to have reasons that we lose ourselves, that we hemorrhage energetically, that we lose our power, that we lose our focus. That's what life here is all about, that we lose our temper, that we get. The object is to find a practice that doesn't, it, it, that doesn't cause you to lose more power in the practice 
or in your attitudes or in the way, but rather that you lift and empower yourself. And so much of that is, all of it is dependent on what your belief system is and the words you use and whether those words are empowering words of grace. Grace, put that word down, that's one. And whether the word, the way you think, here's a word I want you to put in, illuminates you. Illumination, put that word down, holy language. Whether how you think brings light to bear upon your reasoning. Whether the way you reason puts you in the dark or puts you in the light, to illuminate, to put light upon wherever you are, to turn the light of your soul on so that you may, word number three, reflect upon whatever it is, whatever circumstance, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're dwelling on, Dwell is holy language. To dwell in something. I need to dwell in this thought. I need to reflect upon it. Thinking is reactive. There's no depth in the same way that uh, the word reflect. I need to reflect. I need to turn it this way, turn it that way and see what it catches in the sun. I need to see how this thought, I, I, I give you how this, this word, this precious word got animated in me. I was having dinner with friends of mine in England. The, the first, the first um, friends I had in England, this wonderful Irish couple, Pat, Patty and Sheila, and they were from Ireland, and Sheila was put into one of those horrible Irish um, orphanages, and she escaped, and it was brutal. And... No, because she wasn't an, well, sort of, yeah, the Magdalene, yeah. Anyway, um, she was very Catholic, and she had a large circle of friends who were nuns. And uh, she became a nurse, so they were nuns and nurses were her life. And so through the years, I got to know a lot of them because I was there a lot. I was there all the time. And then we would always have these dinners, and she would always have the nurses and the nuns over. And they were just the most raucous, hilarious, <laughs> wonderful group. And along the way, one of them became the abbess of her community. She was absolutely magnificent, a woman of impeccable dignity. And one day she was telling a story, and she was miffed, a little bit miffed. That's not holy language. She was a little bit miffed that she had received a letter from the bishop. That, this is so funny. It just struck my ear as so funny. I, she said, oh, I received an email from the bishop, an email. Now, if you, <coughs> growing up Catholic, I never heard email and bishop in the same. All right, so it just, you know, okay. I did, and that right there struck me like how times have changed. And she said he asked her something. And then he got impatient with her because she hadn't answered right away. And then she said, well, I told him, you had all this time to reflect upon what you asked me and I require as much time to reflect upon the answer. She followed by saying the lives of many women and, and the lives of those these women are in charge of are connected to the response I give you. This is reflection. Suddenly, that one word, now this is what makes a word holy. This is what makes a word animate you. Boom! It expands the way it calls you to think. 
your inner horizon expands beyond your needs. And it causes you to think of an inner spectrum that says, that puts you in the position of a higher cosmic truth, that you are connected to the whole. And whether it's the obvious whole of the responsibility you have as an abbess to your community, and then they in turn to their students that they teach as a teaching community or as a nursing community, or whether it is your family or your community in which you live or your friends, or just who you are, and you make a decision for yourself to decide, I think I need to deal with my temper, like I did once upon a time in a gutter. Knowing that will impact my life and my, and that ain't gonna happen again to me. Or the decisions you make, because that will change my human community dynamic forever. You reflect upon, reflection is a holy, <coughs> powerful word. And it causes you to put a mirror to yourself and to hold yourself, and here is a powerful word, accountable. Never mind responsible. I think that word is worn out, and it doesn't take you anywhere. It, in fact, gets you off the hook because it doesn't call for action. Whereas the word accountability calls you to change what it is you're holding yourself accountable for. I'm accountable for this, therefore what? If you were an accountant, it was like the bottom line here says you're in debt, therefore what are you gonna do about it? Accountability is very different than responsibility. Someone says, I know I'm responsible for that. I, the way I hear people use that word, they think saying that is enough to let them off the hook. No, it's not. What are you going to do because you are responsible for this? Owning it is not the same as saying, and therefore, I will do this. I will change that. I will do this. Accountability is the thing that really matters. And reflection, and you put that in yourself and you think, I need to do a practice of reflection. I need to really think, why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I say? Why do I choose the words I, how will I respond? How will I respond? And, and when you have a practice of reflection, you start to become very mindful of the words you use to yourself as well as to others. You up it and you think, why am I calling this a bad day? Why am I doing that? Why am I calling this a bad day? When I could say it's a good day, why did I choose to say it's a bad day? Because something made me angry, because I, I didn't get the attention I wanted, because my plans were disrupted. Maybe they were supposed to be disrupted. How do I know if this is a bad day or a good day? By what standard do I measure that? It's all subjective. It's because Carol's not happy today. By what standard did I call, why did I call this a bad, I'm having a bad day? I remember, that's a long story and I'm gonna to get to the bottom, I'll get to the bottom of it, but if we had all day, I'll tell you the whole story because it's fascinating, but anyway, the bottom of it is this. <laughs> I ended up on a bus in Moscow next to this Buddhist monk. I took that opportunity to complain because I thought, who, how often are you provided a Buddhist monk? <laughs> you should have known me in my 30s. So then I start complaining. And then this happened and this happened and this happened. And while I'm complaining, because I decided the whole thing was just a mess, because I was doing first column addition well, if I was unhappy and things were not easy and things were this and I was impatient and it didn't work out and nobody was there at the airport in Moscow to meet me and yap, 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 yap. And obviously by my view of the universe, therefore, huh, and he's going like this. 
So I'm thinking, I have to speak louder. <laughs> oh my God! Not will you shut up, but no, me? I think, well, obviously you can't hear me. And you certainly have to hear me. You are missing the opportunity to hear me. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, okay. Oh, I should have flushed myself down the toilet, really. I should have. Oh, my God. Anyway, so I get louder and even more animated. Ooh. I was like a... And he goes, finally, after I exhausted myself with my own story, oh, I can't believe I tell you these things, really. You'd think I just would stop humiliating myself by telling you the truth. He goes like this. Wait, 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 I have to do this right. Wait. Wait. Done? <laughs> well, that wasn't the response I was expecting. I thought he was going to say something really more compassionate and more like, oh, you poor thing, well, did it. But it wasn't. It was like, all done? And a soft voice. Who has a soft voice? I was screaming at him. <laughs> so... And I had concluded it by, well, obviously, in my childlike mathematics, because I had been uncomfortable, delayed, frightened, irritated. Therefore, I concluded, obviously, I shouldn't have come. It was a mistake, because if God meant me to come, it would have been easy, simple, comfortable, bleh, bleh, bleh. I would have had a limo, a driver. I, th t t I was just, the way stupid people think. So he says, huh. well, that's one way to think of it. And he's speaking softly to punish me. <laughs> to, <laughs> to, get, to teach me, shut up, you know, to teach me, right? And so I'm listening to him, and I'm really leaning in closely, and I'm getting silent, right? And he said, but the other way to think is that sometimes when God wants something wonderful to happen, he lets a lot of meaningless things happen to take all the debris away so that the perfect thing can come in. And I went, I said, wow, wow, that's incredible. I said, you know what, get this. I said, you know what, I would have come all the way here to Moscow to learn that. He said, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, you're right, you're right, I did. You're right, I did. I, and then I went into ecstasy. See how simple and what a child I am? See, I, right, okay. It doesn't take much. I'm like, here's a lollipop. Shut up. But really, just give me a holy lollipop and I'm happy. <laughs> really, right? Just give me a holy lollipop and I'm happy. It's really the truth. It doesn't take much. Oh, my God. Reflection. To reflect. When you have a decision to make, Put the word reflection in. You have a choice. You can say, i got to think about that. Or you could shift gears and go up to the holy altitude and say, you know what? I need to reflect on this. I need to reflect. And when you use that word and hit that, you need to, realize, you need to remind yourself you're going into your soul. You're shifting from your mind to your soul. This is what holy language does. Now, when you... Use holy language. What you need to know is I'm now engaging the companionship of my soul. It, you don't have to know in the moment that you think, I don't feel any different, but everything is different. Everything is different. When you, when you invoke, invoke, the presence of your soul. Don't expect that the lights are going to go out and all this is going to change, but everything changes. 
There is, everything is different the second you shift gears and you begin to use holy language. You immediately begin a dialogue of prayer, even within yourself. You are no longer thinking, you are now praying. Even if the prayer sounds like the prayers I read you, which just are dialogue with God. There is none of my prayers will ever say, oh, holy Lord, bless me, blah, 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 blah. No, I don't, I dialogue with heaven, just as you dialogue. You say, I have to reflect on this. What am, I, what am I going to do here? How should I think of this? What is the way I should put this in perspective? How are my actions affecting others? I need, I need a window. I need a window. I have the sensitivity to know this. And perhaps I'm afraid to know this. But if I am, open me up. Expand my capacity. Grant, grant my heart a wider lens and me the courage to have that wider lens. And that's how prayer and reflection, this is holy language. How you speak to yourself becomes a means through which heaven then, then just sit there and, you're, and, and I promise you what is happening is your angel saying, okay, we're gonna do this. I'll open your heart. And sometimes it's surgical. And sometimes it's a holy lollipop. Both are true. But sometimes it's surgical. Which is why sometimes people have heart attacks. And when they have heart attacks, what do they say when they get out? Oh my God, I'm going to live differently. Oh my God, I appreciate my... What? You could pray your way through and not have a literal heart attack. You could also reflect your way through and realize, you know what, I'm not, you can sense if you go into reflection, you can sense I am jamming this dam here. I'm jamming the dam. What do you really think your life's for? Accumulating stuff? Do you actually think that's what your life's for? Accumulating stuff? Everything about you. What do you think your life's for? What do you think you were born for? Other people noticing you? Do you think that's what you were born for so that other people can notice you? Are you crazy? But maybe you are. You were born to make everybody else better. So put that as the, the main. You were born to make everybody else's life better in some way. You are an agent of transformation. That's what you are. You're an agent of holiness. You're an agent of transformation. You have in you the capacity that every choice and every way you think and every choice you make has the potential of changing a human being's life. Every choice, not just one, and not great big huge ones like, I have to do something great big huge that everybody can see. If a smile of someone standing in a car stopped a person from committing suicide, and I know that for a fact, I know it for a fact, I am the one who wrote the book on it. I met the person. You know that if you look at someone and go, it crushes them for life. That's, a, that's not even a second long. And you destroy somebody. Every act, you need to reflect on, I'm going to reflect on how shall I be in the world today. There isn't one act of kindness that, that does not have power. Nothing. Everything. Everything has power. Everything you do. How you look at anybody. How you think of some, don't, we are now poorest creatures. And you know, one time, um, I was boarding a plane with my brother. He was going with me on, a, on workshop tours. We're getting on a plane, and in those days, one of the airlines had these, this red carpet thing that people stood on for first class. 
and then there was no class, and there was this <laughs> class. <coughs> and so we were in line, and I got in line first, and my brother had gone to the loo. So I'm in line, and my brother's six foot one. And standing behind me was somebody, was a man who was not six foot one. Are you getting my, right? He, so my brother comes in. Now my brother is like a teddy bear. He is flawless in that he's kind and he is, um, I met David because of my brother. He, my brother doesn't have a harsh word to say about anybody. He doesn't even know what a harsh word is. And just thinks everybody's good and He's just that, he's just such a good man. So he comes bouncing up, and that's why I like to travel with him. He's just my teddy bear. So he bounces up in line, and he stands next to me, and my brother's defenseless. He doesn't see negativity, but I do. But I do. I have a real good receptor for darkness and evil, and I see it and I sense it. So he walks past this man to stand next to me. And this man, his daggers came out. As if, you know, you should go to the back of the line. Now, first of all, if you're going to go into a battle in life, don't be a jackass. Pick a battle that's worth, work for the justice of kids in cages. But for Christ's sake, don't, do you care where you stand in line to get into a dirty airplane? To, a, to go sit in a dirty seat, it's incomprehensible to me. It's incomprehensible to me. Okay. So he, I could, I could feel, I could feel him going into a fever pitch. I could feel the vibration around him. I could feel the heat. And I turned and looked. He didn't say a thing, did not say a thing, but he was radiating so much venom. And I, 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 I looked at him and I was like, it was like a fever coming off of him. Now I'm gonna hit a pause button here and tell you, you are as porous as, so th this, this idea of needing to protect yourselves energetically is something I, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about right now. So we go on the plane, we're on the jetway, and he walks past my brother, and I saw my brother go like, he didn't say anything to my brother, nothing. But he walked past my brother, and I saw my brother go like this. And then when we got to Denver, my brother spun into an illness. He got a fever, he got nausea, he got, and, and it, I know it was all because of that. Now that guy couldn't infect me but he got my brother. Now, holy language. One of the reasons you want to, I will encourage you, let me put it this way. I need to encourage you to begin a morning with download me in a field of grace, hover over me, hover over me. And however it is you address the divine, Find your own word, whatever you're comfortable with. I don't need to hear from you a letter about, I don't use Lord, this. I'm not interested in what you call. I could care less. Keep your politics of God away from me. I have no respect for it. So I'm going to be direct with you right now. You find your way, I have mine. So whatever you want, go use. I don't care, if you, you, I don't care what you call the divine. That's your business. My business is mine. But however it is you address the divine, find you recognize that your soul has an immune system. And you have to think about that immune system is a field of grace. And you want to keep yourself in a field of grace. You want to maintain that. You want to maintain, and that is the third column that's, that's 
that number 11, you want to reside in a cosmic field of grace. You want that protection. So the psychic free radicals, when people sneeze their negativity, and all this, remember, here I'm going to hit a pause button. How does creation work? How does it work? What's the law? Law is that energy creates matter. Agreed? Thought goes into form. Agreed? Well, what about all your Lucy thoughts that are undirected? Where do they go? Where do they go? Where do all your Lucy thoughts go that are not exactly directed to a project? They're just Lucy. Like when you have a thought like, <coughs> oh, that, that horrible person or this is awful, or, or all your just low-grade negative garbage. Where do those thoughts go? Into an anchor. Uh, into what kind of anchor? Anchor. Into, but what kind of anchor? Uh, one that keeps me from maybe experiencing. Just you? Oh, no, everybody else. <laughs> no. What if it goes into one great, big, huge, collective human anchor? Like, it, like where, do, where does our trash go? Where does our trash go? I want you to think every week your trash gets collected, does it not? And it goes into a landfill. Yes. And I want you to think of all of our collective little debris negativity going into a huge psychic debris landfill. A dump. Is that called a dump? Yeah. A dump. A dump. And that eventually all, these, all this energetic and a collection of energy follows the laws of creation because energy has to create matter. It has to. And that negative energy generates negative energetic actions on the collective. This is what makes war. It is this kind of negativity that causes collective insanity. It creates epidemics. Viruses rise from this, pollution rise. It is, these are collective events that feed off of this. Collective madness. These are the collective madnesses that when we look and say, how can people do that? That's how. Because these are tribal events that, that feed off of unconscious responses that everybody in the global tribe generates. We are feeding this. <coughs> are you with me here? Yes. Okay. So what, when we realize, you know, I, I am part, to, I am, we are all putting trash in the landfill. We're all doing it. Now, some of us, what we think is that our trash is cleaner because we're recycling. It's trash. For Christ's sake, it's trash. Stop telling yourself your trash is cleaner because you're recycling. Trash is trash. You're just more conscious of rinsing out your trash. I think I'll rinse out this thought. I think I'll put, I'll use recycled thought. I'll use a recycled plastic thought. I think I'll use a bamboo thought, I think, because it's been bambooized, for God's sake. I'm human beings, what they tell themselves just amuses the hell out of me. It's still trash. OK. But what, you, what we have to do is become incredibly mindful of we are generating what am I generating? What am I generating? What am I generating? I deeply believe, I deeply, deeply, deeply believe that as we, a rising tide lifts all boats. That's a law, right? A rising tide, everything goes up. And the object of all of us is as you rise within you, those who are suffering the same things you are suffering are rising with you. So even in the privacy of your heart, if you can resolve something, those 
who are you, you are connected to, who are struggling with the same issue, are going to feel it in some way. In some way, someone else in the privacy of his or her heart, whose heart is broken, will in some way that night receive grace and they'll hear, I will heal this. And they'll heal it because you did. Because we are all one. And they will know that they will get through. That your effort has carried them. That is what reflects like, I, I, I can do this. I can do this. If not for me, I'm going to just do this. Because this is human beings. We have to heal. We cannot stay in our debris. I am not staying in a landfill. I'm going to give you an image. Either you stay in the landfill or you get out. And you reflect on that. I'm not staying in a landfill. I will not do it. I will not become methane gas. I will not. I will not. I will not become methane gas because <coughs> that's what your debris becomes. Are you with me here? And the way is I have, to, I have to language this in holy language. All things come to an end. There's death and rebirth. And I have, to, I have to go to rebirth. Here's a word I have to give you that is a grace. And I oftentimes hear people say, you have to excuse me, I'm beginning to get a, a cold and I, I need a little hit of tea here. Um, Where would we be without tea? Oh, thank you. Um, I oftentimes hear people say, um, I can't endure anymore. Endure this. And maybe that's not a word you use very much, but you may think or say it in this way, I can't stand this anymore. Have you, do you ever say anything like that? Okay, what is it that would bring you to that? What is it that would make you say that? Can you think of something? But what, I got it. I know what it means, but I'm asking you what situation would make you feel that way. Now I need to reflect. Oh, okay. All right, well, 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 <coughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> well done, you. But historically. Um, I have uh, felt that way when I'm overwhelmed and anything that I'm trying to get out of where I'm at isn't succeeding. And I just keep, uh, I just get tired and feel hopeless. Like, I know those are all the emotions, but... Right. So I'm going to... May I push a little further? Mm. Is, is what generates that emotion? Is it, is it because you're not getting your way? For sure. Okay, so well, there, there we go. Yeah, Why don't no, you just say good. that? Right. I I'm, am not getting my way. There you go. See how simple? Yes. It's a battle of will. Right. And it's usually between you and what? Or who? Um, work people at work or okay so it's a power play right yeah. okay all right you, you, I want you to remember that so how many of you get that when you're in the middle of a power play mm. battle of will and a power play okay and when it's in a power play um, how many of you get yourself in power plays on a fear, fairly Fairly regular basis. What is that? Okay. Okay. All right. How many of you get yourself in power plays on a regular basis? I love when someone does this. No, I don't really. No. <laughs> that was fabulous. That was fabulous. No, I don't. Do you? I don't. I don't. That was fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, do, do. I'm, I'm present time. Present time. How many? 
Okay, what triggers your power plays? What kind? I mean, because it's not everything. I mean, what triggers your power play? Wait. Uh, hanging on to the illusion of justice. No, that doesn't get you in a power play. It's when you feel something has not fairly been dealt with for you. Say it properly. Well, then I take things personally that aren't about me when it comes okay, to whatever, injustice. Okay, whatever, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's about when you the kids see injustice being done and it blah, 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 blah. It goes that way. Okay, what else? Yeah. Well, I find um, people don't see things my way. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> I know, I isn't that? Have you ever what? said to someone, I need to talk to you because you're not seeing it my way? No, I, I didn't realize that's really what is there. Did you, have you ever actually said to someone, here's the issue. You just don't see it my way, and I think you should. <laughs> no, I, I think it would save me in many meetings. They, really? It would reduce I, a I've lot of effort. I've actually gone up to someone and said, here's the opportunity. You're missing an opportunity to see this my way, and I want you to think about that. <laughs> and that person went like this. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> I thought I was crazy. Oh my God. They think I'm eccentric, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. It's not on? Can you yeah. hear me? Okay, there. Yeah, when someone's tailgating me or trying to push me off the exit or entrance ramp, that's a power play, and I get triggered by that. And what happens? Do you, are you I one swear. of those old women that slow down? No, nope, I swear, and I and I, I rev it. Usually, I just swear at him. And I'm sorry. I swear. I swear. Oh, okay. You swear what? That you um, don't slow down? No. No, I swear at the driver. Oh, oh wow. Okay. With my windows up. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I'll have to teach you how to slow down and drive them really crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what else? Yeah. What about physical pain? Wait a minute. I need to have a microphone. What about a physical pain? Like, I don't know, an example of, say, a migraine or something that's just getting worse and worse and worse. How do you think yourself out of that? Or what holy language can you use to... For healing. Uh, or just for relief from physical pain. Physical pain. Okay. Um, I want to back up and say, where were you before the migraine hit? Because a migraine is a fire disorder. Yeah, perhaps in thoughts about a power play at work, for instance. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Okay, migraine is, is a fire disorder more than an earth disorder. We are all four elements. And one way to understand, again, let's get to the third column and go into it symbolically, like through holy language. Go in through your soul and say, what, I'm off balance here. So you could go through the elements and you could, you could ask yourself, Did I, is there a fire going on in my brain? Which is what, so I have to reflect, did I, Fire and air, they need each other. So air means what, how was I thinking? Where was I jammed? And usually with a migraine, it's kind of like arthritis of the brain, which means I have been trying to get a thought into someone else's thought system. I've been trying to move their structure or they're trying to move my structure and I'm building a wall to block and I'm enraged and I can't protect myself or I can't um, explain whatever it is, but it's a fire. It's a fire out of anger or frustration or fear. Those are the, <coughs> the three reasons you have a fire. 
Does that make any sense to you? Okay, so how are you going to, no, 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 no. How are you going to put out the fire? You know, you can't shift a poop. You can't sh Sorry. think. Shifting thinking is never enough to heal, which is why I asked you. You actually have to initiate a different pattern. You have to. So I can shift my thinking and decide. You know what? That's right. I'm trying to, but that won't work because that won't. If thinking does not speak to your heart. Maybe okay. Except that I cannot. Why doesn't this microphone? Get I'm sorry. Maybe except um, that that you know I can't. It's not my place to affect that other person's thinking. Just look inside myself okay. and see maybe where I'm thinking okay. in a similar manner. I don't know. What, yeah. I don't. I don't know what the circumstances are and whatever. But I know that the truth applies in all circumstances. So somehow what I'm about to say is going to be applicable, and that's that. Through the lens of the soul, you will see some portal in which this will be applicable, and that's I need to detach. I need to detach. I am trying to impose my will in a circumstance where my will doesn't belong. I'm trying to impose myself. And, and where thinking comes in, and I want you to go to the first column, where thinking, first and second column, where thinking comes in, is thinking is a very rational thing to do. And thinking is exactly what you need to do when you're cooking. <laughs> How do I make this? How do I make it better? Does it need a little more or a little less of this? I have the right temperature. I have to think about that. I have to think about what I'm going to serve when these people come over. I don't require my soul for that, to be in high gear. My dinner parties are not about what should I serve to heal. I don't have to go into high gear. I don't need my soul can rest. It can rest. I can just go about thinking, I'm in low gear. But when I feel myself losing balance, my agenda is becoming contaminated. I'm now thinking, I want to make a dinner because I want something from someone. I, I'm cooking because I want to change their mind, get them this, Get them that I want, I want whatever I want. I, I'm up to something. I now have whatever it is. Do you understand? I have it. And it's not in my plans to say, just come on over for a casual dinner at my house is a rue. There is, it's not a casual dinner. I have every intention of manipulating and blah, 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 which is why, by the way, I'm always up front. I will say to people, I'm going to manipulate you tonight, but I'm serving dinner. I am always up front, always. I never, ever, ever spring a, a trick on someone or a manipulation. I always will say, I'm, I'm, I want you to come over, but I have a, I'm, going to, I'm going to hit you for money for this cause. So dress casually. <laughs> and I'm hitting you big time, because this matters. If you don't want to come over, don't come over, but boy, will you pay for it. <laughs> That's how I fundraise. And I only fundraise for things I really believe in, homeless people. And I say to everybody, you got a home, pay up. See, guilt works. <laughs> right, so that, does that help you? Immensely. I got other holy language, so that's all, you're my last question. Okay, so uh, then there's the opposite. I mean, what if, uh, uh, it's coming at you. You're not really, well, I guess it doesn't make any difference. You're not generating um, a battle or a, a, a will, but it's coming at What's you. What's the it? The it? Oh, maybe somebody manipulating me, you know, for instance. And then I, I'm perhaps stunned and okay, my, that's good. I'm crestfallen. Uh, Carolyn, but listen, 
no matter what's happening on the outside. You and your, you asked me that question from the first column. Yes. Okay, so now I want you to, to, to separate. This is really, really, really hard to do. Yeah. yeah. Really hard, it's so hard. It's like my experience with the guy who ripped me off in my cabinets. It's very hard to say you're an illusion and so is that boat. No, it's not. <laughs> but how do we separate when we feel like I have never been stolen from and I've never stolen anything and bap, 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 bap. Okay, nothing's more difficult. Family members, breaking of trust, it's brutal. But this is where I would take your hand and say, OK, this is the roughest climb. This is like finding out you live on the 400th floor and the elevator broke. And up we go, one floor at a time. And on every floor, we have to sit down and have this discussion, which is, OK, on every floor, we're going to discuss the same thing as your spiritual director. And on every floor, we're going to tell the story getting a little bit more impersonal a little bit more symbolic, as if it happened on the first 10 floors it happened to you, but on the next 10 it just happened. Yeah, some, sometimes. Um, Do you see the difference? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, I'm, and every floor we go up, I want you to see it a little differently. I don't want you to change the, the facts, yeah. but I want you to tell it a little bit with a little more distance and a much wider view. I want you to tell the story differently on every floor of the building as you go up with a different view. I'm not asking you to, ch to, to tell me it didn't happen. It did happen. But I want you to see it differently. And as you get past the fifth floor, it simply became something that happened, not to you, but something that happened. Like my cab, like they were no longer my cabinets. He didn't make the cabin the cabinets. I'm changing my language. That made all the difference. He didn't make the cabinets. Could have been anyone. He probably would have done that to anybody. It wasn't me. Now, he wasn't targeting me anymore. Anybody who'd given him that amount of money, he would have gone batshit crazy. The higher I got, the more I saw. The more I saw, the faster I healed. The more you can get higher, no matter what you're dealing with, the more your power begins to center. And you see it with that perspective. But the climb up. It's very difficult. And one way you can do this when you're on your own and not with me as a spiritual director is I got to climb one more floor. I have to tell myself the story again, but I have to do it in holy language. I have to get impersonal because there's nothing personal about the cosmos. When events happen to you, you were not targeted. Now, pay very careful attention to what I'm saying. Guidance is targeted. Guidance is targeted specifically to you. Guidance is very personal. You are personally very guided, very directed. Guidance has your name on it. Your charism has your name on it. Your grace has your name on it. Absolutely. But the events, first column, the events of life that happen to all of us are not targeted. They are events that we are co-creating, floods and fires and, and, and the human negativity. It, it can be that if we're caught up in it, it could be a matter of our karma. It could be a matter of this playing out or that playing out. It could be, you know, a matter of all of us have a mixture of cologne, eau de toilette and perfume karma. And some of it is perfume, which means we are targeted. We are supposed to be here. We are supposed to have this. And sometimes we have eau de toilette. One of those things. Just one of those things. 
we were caught up in a storm and, and, and you know, a, a tree fell and it broke my car. It's one of those things. I wasn't targeted to have my car broken, but the thing fell and it, it was one of those things. A lot of us had damaged cars that day. It wasn't personal. If I had stood there and said, oh, why me, Lord? Come on. That's one of those Cologne events. It's environmental. It's this or that. Right now, my basement, I'm, I'm having to re <coughs> winterize my basement because last winter it was so bloody cold with these earth changes and climate changes, 50 below zero in the Midwest, 50 below. And my house couldn't keep up. It was 40, 40, between 39 and 42 degrees in my house, in my house for days. So yeah, so I, I had to, I have to winterize my basement. I mean, a house can't, can't keep it, right? It was, it's not personal. You know, you could look and say, oh my God, why is this happening? Who, what kind of, that's when I would expect a lightning bolt right up my tuchus. <laughs> you know, have you learned nothing? <laughs> not being able to discern what is, what is personal and what is not. Do you, do you see? So you, and, and this is where getting impersonal is your armor, and, but what it takes is humbleness. And that's, that's where all the great teachers say, take your shoes off on sacred ground. Your life is sacred ground. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is holy language where you think, I have to take my shoes off right now, symbolically. I am not going to, and this is Taoism. I love this, love it. Learn never to attach to a spectacle. Learn to recognize, this is holy language. Learn to recognize a spectacle. What is worth attaching to? Really, what's worth attaching to? <coughs> what is worth attaching to? Even, even I mean, I, to me, what is more egregious than putting children, a human being, in care? What? I mean, okay. But if I were to be sent there, if I, could, if I heard, get, get, get going, get over there, I would not ever, I would hold, put a bit in my mouth, and I would go impersonally. I would not get passioned up and fired up because then, I would lose the war. Because the last thing that protects you is your rage and your anger. You've lost already. Because you, what, you, what you will do is you will think that your rage and anger is righteous. And nobody but, but you will ever think that. Ever. And you will spend your whole life, your whole life, Telling the story of your anger. Telling the story of your rage. And no one will validate it. Nobody. Because only you will think that. And you will want, you will want some kind of reparation for your anger. Who should give you reparation because you're angry? That's your choice to be angry. Who? Who in their right mind? We say, how much money do you want because you're angry? You poor thing. You're angry. Do you think you're entitled to money? Do you think you're entitled to attention? Because you're angry. It's your choice to be angry. It's your foolish, foolish choice. Because something shouldn't have happened to you. I don't know what should have happened to you or should not have happened to you. I don't know what the history is with everybody else. Something happened to you that, you know, but I do know this, that in you resolving whatever it is that did happen, that won't help you. Being detached and moving through the karma like a Zen warrior, now that will help you. That will help you because it will help you see the choices you need to make without attachment. Without attachment. Anger will get you attached to every petty word someone says. Because they say that to me. Well, you're standing right there. Who else are they supposed to say it to? 
<laughs> I can say it to you, I'll say it to Jim, I'll say, but I mean, you're the one standing there, right? It's so silly. Life is still, isn't life silly? Does that help you? Or another word, I'm moving on. You have to have this word in your vocabulary. You have to. You may not like it, but I'm putting it in. These two words, sin. You need the word sin. I know it is not a Catholic word, but they're famous for it. <laughs> you need to put that word back. And I, and what is a sin? And I am convinced that people are back in therapy by the droves because they don't, because the word sin and the word confession have been taken out of our vocabulary. And I'll tell you why. I think people don't heal because the word sin goes to the soul. And let me explain what a sin is. You know, I've observed for now almost 40 years the healing process and people saying, I'm working on it. I'm, what the hell are you working on? Either you, you, you let it go or you don't. Either forgive. And forgiveness is where we're going. I'm going to throw that in the mix here, the trilogy. And what is so hard about forgiveness? What makes it so hard? You can't forgive it, but here's the thing. It's because, and they go to therapy, and they're working out, working on it, working on it. All they do is tell the same story. And, and so, and it'll never help because they get on a hamster wheel. And the thing is, they don't actually get to the heart of what this, the real issue is. And the real issue is because they don't have the right language. And the right language is they need the word sin. Because what a sin is, is a conscious act, knowingly using your will to consciously harm another person. I, by choice, consciously am choosing to do something to harm another person, or I know fully that my action is something another, that will change another person's life for the worst. And I know it, and it doesn't stop me. Now, the emphasis is on the word conscious. I am fully conscious that what I'm about to choose, the power of choice, will harm your life or your life or your life. My angel has alerted me. My conscience has alerted me that I am going to, that this will hurt you perhaps for the rest of your life. But I don't, doesn't stop me. I do it anyway. I do it anyway. I bust up your marriage. I do whatever. And then I, I walk into you a few years later and say, I never meant to hurt you. Jesus, I never meant to hurt you. <laughs> now, and I can't figure out why she won't let it go. Yeah. What's the matter with you? Be a bigger person. So now I blame you because I put myself off the hook. Can't figure out why. I apologized. I took, here's the word I loathe, responsibility for it. But here is where we fall apart. Because built into that apology is the big lie. I never meant to hurt you. What she and I both know is the truth, which is it was conscious. It was fully conscious, and I knew it was conscious. And I knew every step of the way that I was also told it was conscious, and I was about to use my will to destroy another person's life, and it didn't stop me, and that is what a sin is. The choice, the conscious choice to harm another. And if I had said, we need to talk, I have to tell you something. What I did was fully conscious. It was fully conscious. This isn't about hurting you. This is about I sinned. It was a sin. My soul has harmed your soul. I've wounded you at the level of soul, and I need forgiveness. This isn't about apology. We're going deeper. I own the sin. 
Now that is a different level of healing. You can't get to the soul in therapy. I'm sorry, but you cannot. You need holy language. You need to say, I have sinned. This is a sin. I chose this, and I, I wounded your soul, and I was guided not to do this because there is never a time, and you will never be able to, to say this properly. Honestly, you will always say, I was told ahead of time, don't do this. Because all of you have an angel, and every one of you has always heard ahead of time, don't do this. And that is your angel. And you have always been told ahead of time, don't do this. Don't say this. Are you sure you want to say this? That is your angel. And if you go ahead with it, that is a sin. Now you're in the territory of sin. They don't care if you buy cars. They don't care what you do with your money. That, heaven says, Ugh, you want to get, create a mess for yourself? Create a mess. But boy, oh boy, if you make a choice to harm the life of another human being and you are consciously doing it, you are playing ball at another level. Now you're in the soul. And now we're dealing with eternity. Now we're dealing with karma. This is why the word karma exists. Now you're wounding at the soul, and heaven says, well, we'll set this up again. You will meet again. You will meet again. Because you will have to put this right. And if you said to this person, I, 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 I have to confess, I, it was a sin. It's healed. That's when a person could say to you, thank you. I forgive. Now you can forgive. Because the soul is acknowledged and the depth of that choice is acknowledged. This is why we need holy language back. We need it. We can't get to the soul without you can't say, oh what a bummer, or I'm just sorry, or you know, no, 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 no. No. You need this. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah? Wait a minute, Beth. So if the uh, person who is apologizing to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is not using holy language, yeah. but just the words... Like, like I'm sorry? No. says it says, I, I sinned against you. But it is it holy language. But if he, if but if it really, if it doesn't come from, you if can say the words. That, you can say the words without actually, I think, uh, living the words or feeling. Uh, no. no, no, don't you go there. Okay. If you're you're saying, can I punish them? No. <laughs> can I still forgive you? Oh, no, 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 no. You stop. If a person says, I, I really sinned, you better let them off the hook. It's not your job to punish a human being. It's your job to forgive them. So you have to believe that the words that that person chose really means it when they use the word to sin. To the best of their... Nobody's going to say, I sinned, and not mean it. Mm -hmm. Nobody. You don't play with that word. I have to tell you something. If someone says that word, even if they think they're playing, they're not. They're not. You can't say that word and some part of you not say, you're going you're gonna to know what this means. You, holy language is alive. It's holy because it talks to you inside. So someone may say, I think I'm just going to go, Catherine, I sinned against you and now I'm going to go out to dinner. Mm -mm. Holy language incubates. It sizzles. And don't let that make you feel good. If someone says, Catherine, it was a sin, and I'm sorry, you better think about what it is to mend your to let go. It goes with forgiveness. That's the match. Sin, forgiveness, yes. And believe you me, you're going to like being free. You're going to like being free. It's a lot better than being in that 
little cocoon of bitterness. Anybody else? Yes, my darling. Wiped out half my practice. I what did what, honey? <laughs> I said it's just wiped out half my practice. <laughs> I realized that in working with people as a therapist, by not calling it what it really is, we const I constantly let them off the hook. Yeah. You can't let you can't that's right. And which isn't my job anyway. But we kind of, it's a dance. It's yeah, not, it's just a it's, dance. You just yeah. say, how you coddle them, how you feel. Yeah. You want to tell me your story again? Yeah. Finally, yeah. say, stop it. Yeah. Stop it. And mind you, you also have to say to someone, you need to get in touch with the fact that what you did was conscious. Yeah. You need to go say to that person, I said, grow up, put your big pants on, and get over there. Get a backbone. Stop with the guilt. This guilt is because you did this deliberately. Knock it off. I don't want to hear any excuses from your childhood. How old is this person in this body? I'm so sick of this. So get your last check from them and kick them out. <laughs> Become a spiritual director instead. Spread your wings. Join the major leagues. Not kidding. Not kidding. You know I'm not. Enough with this. Join the major leagues and go for the soul. All right, anybody else? Yeah. Oh my God, where am I going with this? All right, well. So, um, so you can, can you forgive someone who has sinned against you without asking them to acknowledge the sin? Tell me, how does the option of not forgiving them feel? Not good. Not good. It's up to you then. Yeah. Fair. It's up to you. Yeah. I mean, I don't like living in a dung heap, but it may be comfortable for you. Fair. And, and here's the other thing. You know, you know what's true is I think that you don't, people don't understand what forgiveness is. They really don't get it. Forgiveness is a mystical act. It's not a rational one. It's missed here. Forgiveness is true, true. It is the essence of holy language and the holiest of holy things. I mean, if you really understand the story of Jesus, I mean, listen to me, if you wonder. If one way to understand the story of Jesus, um, and I do not speak as Christian Catholic, so please, I beg you, don't hear it that way. But hear it as this, the story of this being this man who, and honestly, though I grew up Catholic, very Catholic, and was educated in, in Catholic, you know, by, with Jesuits and priests and nuns until I was 29, so in the thick of it, you know what I mean? I mean, really. Still, the more I study Jesus, the more I'm telling you there are times when my jaw drops in amazement. So who knows what's going on in me, but here, is this person who taught for three years in this little dirt hole of a place with illiterate people, and look what he did. There's no Facebook, no Google. He never wrote a thing. Nothing. Three years. What have you accomplished in three years? What can we do? I can't make a book deadline in three years. It's three years. I mean, three bloody years. That's it. Okay. And so, and then at the end of his life, his last thing is he goes into Jerusalem and he has this dinner with these clowns. And, and you know, they, don't, they can't read, they can't write, they can't do anything. And, he prob and he's with Mary Magdalene, who's probably his wife. I think he, absolutely. Because two, two things convinced me. One, he was a rabbi. Rabbis are married. And two, she anointed his body. And if you think they're going to let a woman of the streets touch his body, you're crazy. That's what a wife did. So she prepared his body. And that's a wife's job. So, and three, 
nothing would have annoyed the boys more. And they were annoyed, so it was perfect. OK. So um, even back then, you know. But so he goes in. He has the Last Supper. And he says, you know, do this in memory of me, right? And poor Judas, he gets such a bad rap. He says, all right, go do it. And it's scheduled. So this whole betrayal is, be but here's the thing. You look at everything from the physical, and you think, oh my god, he was betrayed. But symbolically, everything's a setup. Everything's a setup. So Judas splits, and then they go to, and it's important, he has this last meal that's so exquisite. I just love the Mass. I go to the Mass because I need communion. I love communion. I am astounded by it. So he goes to the garden. And this is done for us. What does he do? It's like he's acting out something here, <laughs> saying this is going to, and who knows how conscious he was of any of this. Maybe not conscious of it at all. Who knows? I have no idea. But he says, while these guys are maybe drunk and passed out and sleeping, who knows? But he says, I don't want to do this. Oh my god, I don't want to do this. So if there's any way we can renegotiate this contract. Now, this is important to understand, because what he was actually doing, I think, was laying out the template of what we will go through, what we have to go through in our quest to break through our allegiance, our addiction to the way we want life to be, to human justice, to the way we think we are so addicted to wanting life to be fair to wanting life to be just around us, around us. And if that were to be the case, every one of us would have to be the center of the universe. And God would only have to be on our side. And everybody would have to be born just to serve you. It's so preposterous to think you would always have to be right and everybody else would have to be wrong. What we want is, ha, ha, we want everyone to think, oh, oh, poor you, poor you, poor you. We would all have to be victims and vic I mean, the, it's so preposterous. The only way to survive here, the only way to survive is to get our heads out of our, and become impersonal while living a very personal life, is to finally get the mystic's call. So he says, look, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to live through every single thing you use as an excuse to hate others, to get even, to be resentful. I'll be betrayed. I will be accused of something. Bye-bye. I will be accused of something that I didn't do. I'll be humiliated. All my friends will abandon me, even God. Even God, when I say, please, please, can I do something else this weekend? <laughs> I don't even like these people. And I won't hear something. I won't hear. I won't hear guidance. Me, who every time I look up and say, send me some grace, I want this person to, I want Lazarus to live again. I want this woman's cancer to be healed. Whatever I want, I want to walk on water. Give me a thousand fish. But this night, I hear nothing. Which means that's how God talks. Even nothing's an answer, which is, I don't waste my conversation. You know exactly what you need to do, and I'm not going to tell you twice. So he knows this, and he says, OK, done. So then he's arrested, but he knows he's not abandoned. So when he's, Caiaphas, an idiot, says, oh, well, you go to Pontius Pilate. Go to the Roman. And the Roman says, look, explain yourself, because I know you didn't do anything, and, and uh, that crown looks horrible. And you're a wreck. And of course, he's been beaten up by this time. And he's bloody. And he's, but he says to, to Pilate, he says, you know, you work for me because I agreed to this last night. So this whole gig, this whole thing, let's just get it over with. And 
Pilate says, get him out of here. Crucify him. And bring me some water, element of water. I want to wash my hands of this man. I don't want a connection to him. This, this is too powerful. So what forgiveness really is, is you forgive someone not because you're saying, oh, what you did doesn't matter to precious little me. You finally get, what a frigging setup here. You showed me what I'm capable of destroying. You showed me that I can be so mean. I can be so resentful of what I expect of everybody else. You brought that out in me. And in fact, if it wasn't you, it would have been someone else. It doesn't matter. It could have been my ex-husband. It could have been my child. It could have been this. It doesn't matter. You showed me that I'm capable of some real, deep, serious, badass darkness. And it wouldn't have mattered who. Wouldn't have mattered. I just thought, I'm so special. It shouldn't have happened to me. But I'm not. And that's so humbling. It's a pill I can barely swallow. Goodbye. It's a pill I can barely swallow, but I got to swallow it. And it, it releases me. It releases me because I realize, what's the difference? If you had done it or you had done it, or if you had taken my purse or if you had done it or you, what's the difference? I would have been just as mad. So actually, it doesn't matter. What I learned is I have what it takes to stand in a gutter and scream at somebody. I could have screamed at anybody. I learned I got a, a bad streak. And I thank you for showing that to me. And now I'll work and put myself on the cross. And I will crucify that part of myself that thinks those bad things shouldn't happen to me. That somehow you were supposed to protect me from those injustices. And then when I'm done with that, we're good. We're good. Do you get it? And then you know what happens? Loving somebody. If you really reflect, reflect on how you loved to this point, you'll see it was very conditional. You'll see it's very conditional. That you have no idea how to love at all. At all. That you punished with love. No, I'll love you if, and I'll hold back, and I'll pout, and this. You were a powder lover. You were a punisher. That wasn't love. You punished, you pouted, you hurt. Neat, 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 neat. You loved with just the dust of your heart, but not the gold. And it's not until you really get, you want it to be loved, but then how, how, how can anyone say, that, how can anyone say, I'm, I'm afraid to love because I'll get hurt? Who talks like that? Who talks like that? What, are you going to rot? Are you going to rot? You are a love machine. You are a creature of love. You should, you should get up in the morning and you should say, open up. That's how you should get up. Open up. Who do you want me to love today? That should be your first prayer. Who do you want me to love today? Illuminate. Lights on and off you go. You don't look and think, who should love me first? This is not a game. This is a healing apparatus. A healing apparatus. Even if you're not walking down the street saying I'm healed, you walk down and think, just love. That's all. Just wherever it's needed, shine your light through me. That's it. And you know what forgiveness is? And I'll tell you something else about forgiveness. You don't take your own life personally. You think bad things happen. And except for the grace of God, go I so often. So often. And when bad things happen, it's really rough. It's rough. And I think, I wish this didn't happen to me, but it did. And now I got to get out of this. I got to get out of this. And I'll get out of this. We'll get out of this. So help me out of this. 
but I'm not going to say, why me? Because that's a prayer that doesn't get answered. Yeah, yeah. I'll be right there, honey. How do you seek forgiveness as a perpetrator from someone who is dead? I'm a perpetrator and someone has deceased. How do you seek that forgiveness? Oh, nobody dies. Well, I mean, their body's not here. But I mean, um, you know what? So release that karma. Is yeah, what light at. a candle and say I'm talking to you, wherever you are. And I finally realized... So I am sending this to you, through my soul, to you. And let it go. What's your question, honey? Wait, Beth on the run. How are we doing here? Oh, yeah. So the holy language, Caroline, is like taking the words off a page that are just words. And that's, the, I believe, what Jesus means about um, the word became flesh. Because it Ew. then becomes cellular, I am doesn't it? Gold star. I'm putting gold stars all over you. But that really, I mean, it's the language, but when the soul uses the language, when the soul uses the language, if the ego uses the language and says, get up and walk, take your bed up and walk, you're not going to go anywhere. But when you close your eyes and say, God, put grace, let the grace then the soul speaks through you and says, come on, let's take up your bed and walk. That's it. Same words, but they're not. They're not. No, no. It is because your soul is what animates the choices you make in life. And, and just, you know, just in the slightest way, You know what it's like to not put your heart into something, right? Yes. So use that as a Geiger counter to know what it feels like when your soul is in something. Compare it to when you, you know you're putting your heart into something. And then if you can possibly imagine think about like when you put your heart into something and then intensify that by a hundred times. That that is when you think, God, let the grace of healing move through me for this person. That that animation is actually happening. And I think that we don't feel it in its full intensity because I really do think it would burn us. I don't think we could handle it. I think that it's why when Jesus rose from the dead, he said to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me yet. Don't touch me. I'm not ready. I think it's why when, the, when Mary appeared at Fatima to the kids, she's, they were like, this brightness, I can't look yet. Or Bernadette. Or when, when any of those apparitions happen of the great saints, the first response of those who see them is, this light blinded me. It was so blind. And then I could see it, but it was the brightest light that I've ever seen, and it was all this light. It is always all this light that comes. It's this element of light that just comes through, this pure, pure light. And when you think of grace, I, I need you to think of this, this exquisite, and that's what comes through your soul. And when you think, I, God, illuminate me. Here's a prayer. I need that light on in me. Illuminate the dark. I can't see. I, I can't see my way. Talk to me. Talk to me. And sometimes when you go to sleep at night, just say, you know what? I need some candlelight. I'm going to sleep. This is, a, this is one of my favorite prayers. I'm going to sleep. You work it out. <laughs> That's one of my favorite prayers, short and sweet. I'm going to sleep. You work it out. And I'll, I'll talk to you in the morning. And go to sleep. And this is a surrender prayer. But never tell heaven how to work it out. Keep your hands off the steering wheel. Don't be a control freak. Don't go saying, but you know, don't touch this and don't touch that and don't da 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 da. I've got to win. But no, you got to pray like you're crazy. Pray like with crazy trust. 
Like, I'm going to sleep. You work it out. See you in the morning. That is how I pray. Yeah. You have a haircut since. Because I remember long hair and more hair than I've ever had. And now I'll talk to you because you don't have that much. So, Carolyn, um, these two about sin, I'm kind of stuck on sin here. Okay. So, I'm very aware of my own falling short and that I need to address that. Yeah. But when it's other people's sin, Do I actually have any rightful place there at all? Well, do I need to acknowledge those things? What, what do you mean by Tell me what you mean by acknowledge. To indicate that I recognize that something was done that was very off the mark. Do you mean like tell them? Yes, or, or witness to them or, well, I mean, because it seems to me that other people's sin is really sticky. Yeah. You know, and as soon as I, you know, my judgment comes up, uh, my righteousness comes up, um, my desire to have it other ways, I my know, desire for vengeance. My yeah, desire all the for... good things in life. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we all have that arsenal, don't we? So, there, so there's a, a kind of a question of do I, do any of us have a rightful place with other people's sins? It not that a rich question. Okay. So what do we do about that, right? Um, and it's so, it's, we're, we're, it's so off, it's so tempting to want to say to someone, I have to tell you, I think that what you did is a sin and, you know, and then, and then comes the question, you're so judgmental. I'm not being judgmental, I'm being discerning and, you know, um, I have found that silence is the best way. And here's, here is um, holy language. It's holy silence, not silence. And there's a difference. And that's that I, I really have learned, as hard as this is, that in reflection and illumination, I always have to say to myself, what's my agenda in wanting to tell them? And if any part of my agenda, any part, even the slightest, is because I want to be right, because I want to smack them with their wrongness, I can't say a word. It's sticky, and it will backfire. And it will, there is, I remember, and a funny thing, Beth and I were just talking about this. I had a magnificent mentor in college. Magnificent. She taught me. Just by the way she taught, I learned how to teach. Her magnificence in how she taught. She was completely detached from us as students. Her first day of class, she said, my role is to pass on knowledge, not to be liked. Whether you like me is irrelevant. And I, my jaw dropped. And... She was the first nun to ever introduce the concept of detachment. She was just completely detached. And it was, the, it was 17 years old. I was this young human being just mesmerized by this brilliant, brilliant mentor. And she, her, this position of detachment, she modeled, it wasn't about not caring. It was about being so detached that she could communicate truth and not, not um, edit it around whether it would upset you. It was, you need to know this. You deal with it. My task is transfer. And one day, I had, I, um, I took her class in Eastern religions as a freshman, and um, uh, it never occurred to me that I actually had to study religion. <laughs> I th <no. coughs> as a result, when the first quarter grades came in, they weren't like superb. 
and she glided. She didn't walk. Barbara just seemed to glide. And she came up to me and she said, you have a very good brain, and it's unfortunate that no one's taught you how to use it well. And she just kept going. <laughs> but now here's the thing. What astounded me was she delivered what should have been a devastatingly humiliating truth. But I wasn't humiliated. I wasn't devastated. I was inspired. And I stood on the stairs of LaFerre Hall at St. Mary's thinking, how did she do that? How did she manage to inspire me with a knife? How did she do that? I stood there thinking, how did you do that? I'm so inspired. And I'm so inspired. I was so inspired. I, sp I, I studied with her every year from that point on. She became my greatest. Accomplishing that stage of that position of detachment, that position of clarity became a goal of mine. How is it to see that clearly? And of course, that laid the grounds for my becoming a great medical intuitive. To become that detached, to become that clear. She was the beginning of that, that conversation, that moment. And I think that unless a conversation can be had in that exquisite of an atmosphere, it can't be had at all. Because if we have even the slightest, the slightest agenda to pummel someone or to disempower them, we are not permitted to have it by, by, the, by the rules of the soul. Now, the rules of the ego are always going to want to win, but the soul never wants to win. You have to understand the rules of your soul. Your soul is all about healing, and your ego is all about destroying and winning and protecting. See, with holy language, you have to choose, where shall I take this question? Shall I discuss it with my soul or discuss it with my ego? There's a need to reverence the other person's life, and that if I'm able to come from that point, yeah. then I may be able to address, but otherwise I have no business there. Right, and, and, I, and I think, you know, and the building, take the person, if you can, to an archetypal level with you, and just say, what's, what's the archetypal pattern I'm dealing with here? You know, may, maybe this person has an addict. Maybe this person has a warrior. Maybe it's the pattern I'm dealing with, and I need to impersonalize the person that I'm dealing with. And I'm dealing with a pattern. And, and I see this pattern all the time, and, and, and it's me. I've got to deal, learn to deal better with the pattern and not the person, and impersonalize it as much as you impersonalize yourself. Personalized or impersonalized? impersonalized? Impersonalized. Impersonalized. Because at the end of the day, the truth, the higher cosmic truth here in the 10th chakra, is that we, we, everybody is engaged in their archetypal patterns. And that really determines that we're like marionettes to our patterns. You're engaging in my, with my teacher pattern, my mystic pattern. But my, my child's not here, for the most part. You know, you, my prostitute's not, you know, is, is somewhere sitting in the corner. But, you know, the other archetypes in my nature are not present, but I have them. You, you, you know, so one way of, of helping, and this is where holy language is that you say to yourself, I am going to withdraw into my soul and get as high a perspective as I can on what's going on here. What view empowers me? What view causes me to hemorrhage? I have a choice. I have a choice. And, and the next follow-up question, which is worthy to discuss, which is, 
Does that mean, I mean, that every time I get angry, every kind of this, is there no such thing as righteous anger? There is. There are things human beings do that are just plain not okay. They're just plain evil. They're just plain wrong. And, I mean, you know, rape and beating up and stealing and all these things, they're wrong. There's the Ten Commandments are for a reason. But I think what we have to be protect ourselves, we have to protect ourselves, is that when something happens to us, we acknowledge this did happen, this was stolen, this was, I was, whatever. Where we have to be very careful, cautious, etc., is to allow ourselves, to prevent ourselves from thinking that somehow it was targeted to, uh, to allow the victim in us to grab the narrative and tell the story as if to allow the saboteur, the victim, or the wounded child in us to grab hold of the narrative and tell the story again and again as if somehow we were supposed to be protected from any bad any of the difficult passages of human life. As if somehow or other, from the day we were born, we were born special, which meant we should have a passageway through life where, where sudden changes were never supposed to happen to us. Where did we get that idea? It was a myth we told ourselves. We're responsible for the nonsense we told ourselves that somehow we were supposed to be protected, somehow our marriage was never going to go wrong, somehow this was never going to happen. We told ourselves those, those nonsensical things. There was no divine contract that do downloaded that said, oh, by the way, I promise that I will protect you. This is stuff we, we this is our entitlement going bad, you see? And we can't punish other people because they didn't live up to our expectation of being surrounded by perfect friends. I think I'll go tell them they're, they're sinning because they're not perfect and I expect you to be a, entire, surrounded by perfect friends. Well, shut up. Take your moral code and get out. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. language in terms of how to use it to heal um, our relationship with our own soul, maybe for areas where we've sinned against ourselves or um, are maybe struggling and forgiving ourselves? Yeah, sure. I mean, oh, time to go? Oh, bye-bye, darling. Oh, bye, Jan. <laughs> Um, everybody, you know what, I think we will always struggle in some way with forgiveness will always be an issue for every human being. So whether you're struggling to forgive yourself or others, you will, we'll, we're always going to have that issue. Can we agree on that? Okay. Now, what goes with forgiveness is this idea that somehow we can't forgive unless we punish someone. That somehow we have to beat them up, punish them, hurt them. They have to be hurt. We have to hurt ourselves or we have to hurt them in equal measure or greater than to let them know how much they hurt us. That somehow or other I have to take this pain you put in me and beat the hell out of you, to put it back in you, just to show you what you did to me. Somehow we think we're, we're entitled to do that. And that comes from this ingrained Hammurabi's code of an eye for an eye. You took my eye, I'm going to take, and actually in Hammurabi's code, it was actually if you took two ounces, you get to take exactly two ounces from that person because that puts everything back in balance, exactly only. But we now believe if you've taken my eye, I get to take your legs. 
We're brutal and vengeful and nasty. And that's why it just keeps going on and on and on. You take my legs, I'm going to take your children. So we just, the law of vengeance goes nowhere. So with forgiveness, we, I think the only way through is that we finally, you actually get to the mystical meaning, which is it, everything that happens is actually about me looking at why I did what I did or how whatever happened, why do I resent this person? Why do I want to hurt this person? What is it in me that makes me want to hurt another human being? And if I want to hurt this person, I am as likely to want to hurt anybody else. So how am I different from this person? And did this situation happen so that I could learn about myself, that I'm capable of hurting another human being in a circumstance? And is that what I have to let go of that? I have no idea what motivated this person. This person could have hurt me or anybody else. It wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. It may feel personal, but actually it wasn't. Not even a divorce is personal. It feels personal, but it's not. It's not. You could be married to someone who's an addict, and when they start with their addiction, Trust me, they'll let their marriage go, and it's not personal. It's the addiction that's stronger than the situation. Does that help you? Oh, I'm sorry, I am getting this big time break. So let, let's just take a little bit of a break here. I'm getting a break on all ends, and so we'll, we'll break for about 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, we have, we have to bring the ship down now. I still have, oh my goodness, so much. Okay. All right. You, there are other words I need to in, insert into you. You need the word quietude. Quietude. That's beautiful, holy listening. It's a holy vocabulary. You need the word quietude. Quietude is from Teresa of Avila. And Teresa would talk about how in uh, one, of the, one of the ways of, of God is randomness. God is random. So chaos. But blessings are random. Blessings, you know, are just divinely, they're just distributed. So you, I, I, I am going to encourage you to wake up every day and expect at least one blessing, surprise blessing a day. And that's going to be part of your inner life. That every day a blessing somehow is going to come into your life. And Quietude is a type of blessing. Teresa would say a, she would become saturated in deep, profound quietude, which was a transcendent state that her whole being would feel as if it was elevated off the earth in some cosmic quiet silence, not where she couldn't hear anything, but where all the, all the nonsense of the first column was silenced. And she became saturated in holy music, the music of the spheres or in the sound of God, the soundlessness of God, in the waves of God. And it soothed her. It made this, like every cell in her was waves of tranquility. 
And she just, imagine just the whole of you being gently taken apart in waves of tranquility, where no matter what you were dealing with, it suddenly melted, melted into triviality. And you expanded into cosmic, oh my godness. And then she would be delivered back into her body. And that quietude would remain with her for months. Like the, the, the holdover of it. So quietude is a word I just want to give to you. It's say, you know, the grace of quietude, I would love a little bit of the quietude here. It's not like silence. It's not like, it's some, it's an enormous grace that settles, that puts into, it takes you, it puts all that nonsense where it belongs and it lifts you in a trance. You know what it's like, I think? I think that what you experience is what it's like being dead where you are over and above the nonsense of the, what holds you in the illusion of this life while still being connected to this life. So, um, I, had start, I had started to mention a word, and I need to bring you back. I asked about enduring, and I asked you earlier about something like what is it you, you can't stand and when you would use that word, like I just can't stand this, and we got sidetracked down that. We didn't get sidetracked, I didn't bring it back, but I need to bring it back. Because the holy language, the holy word I want you to insert is the grace of endurance. Endurance is a holy and powerful grace. And that is a word I, I rarely hear anyone say, except in this way, I just can't endure this anymore. I just can't. You can't talk to yourself that way. Anyway. You don't, don't talk to yourself that way. You have to tell yourself that, that you, there isn't anything you can't endure. Don't tell yourself you're weak and fragile and breakable. You aren't. You have to tell yourself the truth, that you don't have a breaking point, that there isn't anything you can't endure, that you're absolutely a titanium being. And that what happens around you does not have the authority to defeat you. It may provoke you, may irritate you, but never make the outside world bigger than your inside world. Do you understand? Proportion yourself accordingly. Behind your eyes is the cosmos and the universe and all the legions of heaven. Do not tell yourself that any little pissant thing happening in front of you has the power to bring you down. Never buy that illusion. Whether it's some person that is provoking you, get a grip on yourself. Get a grip on yourself. No matter what someone's telling you, no matter what you're facing, no matter how irritating the school system is, no matter how irritating anything is, the truth is, in the, in the great Taoist teaching, this too is a spectacle that will pass. Be very careful. Remember how powerful a choice is. Be very careful what you attach to. And that if you choose to react, you are also choosing to anchor. Be mindful of that. That if you choose to take it, so what someone says seriously, and you say, how could they say that to me? How could they? You humble up, take your shoes off, and humble up, and realize if I respond that way by thinking I'm so special, then I'm, the price I pay is that I'm actually going to attach myself to that person. You want to do that? People attach themselves to the very person they think is the worst in the world. What are they thinking? <laughs> The, <coughs> the very person that just insulted them, they attach themselves to. What are they thinking? <coughs> what, I, I, it, it, it bog, if you really get it, if you think this person just insulted me, why are you attaching yourself to that person? That's the very person you should detach from 
as fast as you can and realize, I'm not attaching to this spectacle. Absolutely not. And you should also tell yourself the, tr the holy truth. You don't have the power to command me. For God's sake, talk to yourself as though you have wings. Start talking to yourself as though you have wings. And you think, you don't have the power to command me. You don't, you don't have it. I, I, you don't have, and you don't say that with arrogance. You, you hold that truth inside of you. You don't have what it takes to get me to yield to you. You don't have it. I yield to no one on this earth. You don't have the power to get me to yield to you. If someone's judging you, they're doing it because you're intimidating. You don't yield to negativity. You do not do that. You're, you, you protect your soul. You think, I'm not going to yield to it. Are you nuts? That's the devil's weapon. Right? You're going to yield to someone's judgment? I'm you crazy. Think of, put me standing next to you, and what would you do? Yeah, yeah, right? Right? Yeah? How does, that should scare you. Yeah, that would scare you. Right? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, Dark Night of the Soul. And that's that the Dark Night of the Soul is a real journey. And I bring that up because I think that it is a journey a number of people are these days experiencing out of the monastery. And that because it is um, a journey that people are experiencing in everyday life, um, but they don't have the language and they don't recognize it. We are still not accustomed. You, you know, in these years, it is, I have questioned so many people people in, in workshops through the years. I cannot get over how many parents, how many parents, how many people are uncomfortable talking to their kids about God or ever introducing prayer or any type of sacredness within their atmosphere at home at all. When I was, I was doing it, I just did a, this year I shot a um, TV show for Gaia, the Gaia Network. And that was a lot of fun, and they're wonderful people. And during the course of organizing all these 12 episodes, um, I was cautioned not to mention the word God or Jesus, but I could say Buddha. No, 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 okay, yeah, right? Now this is, and so when they did the, seat, the set, they had to create a little set for you, you know, because you need a set. And they put a little Buddha there, which is fine. I have a Buddha in my backyard, and I said, but where's Jesus? And, and so, I mean, of course, this again and again and again, what's reinforced is that Jesus is a Catholic. Or Jesus is Roman, the Roman Catholic. And that Jesus is a Roman Catholic priest and a pedophile, or whatever the teaching. And that there is so little understanding about what this holy being taught and what he represents. And how contaminated Christianity has become. How very contaminated it has become. That it's very difficult to teach or talk about the mystical tradition of Christianity in a comfortable way, whereas I can mention Buddhism and no one reacts. I can mention Hinduism and no one reacts. I can mention Taoism, no one reacts. Druidism for Druids, no one reacts. But I mentioned Christianity and it's the recoil like this. Okay. And it's quite astonishing. 
because it is, <coughs> it is the mystical teachings of Christianity that have so much to do with the teaching of uh, healing and the way of forgiveness, and perhaps that's why they were so intimidating. And it is within that tradition that the path of the dark night of the soul was scripted. It came from the experience of a saint called John of the Cross. I hear people talk about, I have a dark night, and they refer to it because they're having, maybe their heart was broken, or maybe they don't know what, to, what kind of life choice to make, or they're having financial troubles. But that's not a dark night. A dark night is a very specific spiritual journey that what is so rich about understanding your soul and the nature of God and the way heaven works with you is there is always a pattern. There's always a pattern. This, this third column, there's, God is not random. There's always a pattern. Excuse me. Even in the dark night. And the role of the purpose of the dark night is that it has um, two process, two sections. Two. And the first, the first has so much to do with your, your, your first, second, and um, your, the first, it's, let's call it the night of reason. And it, it breaks down, a dark night happens, and it can happen in the middle of your happiest day. And it just descends upon you. It's not about you losing all your money in the stock market. It can happen just when you made all your money. But the darkness comes upon you because it's when God decides, let's go to battle, you and me. It's about you finally contending with my will or yours. Thy will be done. It's the day heaven takes you on. And it's the day you begin the encounter of the breakdown of your beliefs over how you think everything should go, including the belief that if you follow guidance, you should be rewarded. Now, there are so many times I have spoken to people who've said things like, including someone dear to me, who had an accident, survived the accident, and the response was, I must have been saved for something special. The tying of specialness, this idea that every single thing is proof that heaven thinks you're special, must be special. Or that because you suffered, you should have a reward. That every single thing must have some kind of payoff in some way with the heavens. That people suffered in 9-11 and they should be paid off because that happened. Survivors should be paid off. Every pain should be paid off. That somehow because you were in pain, something happened, someone owes you. Nobody owes you anything because you're unhappy or in pain to balance it. You're the one who has to get you out of that. Since when do pe does life owe you anything? Life owes us nothing. Nothing. We just can't get over that. That there isn't a system out there, so we sue people. We become so litigious because we're determined to make People suffer and pay us one way or another. Well, that'll make us happy. Maybe $15 million will compensate for this. Because somehow or other we think this, we are do this. This is how bad narcissism has created this, this litigious world we live in. That somehow, well, we're due. That's how special we think we are and that we should never have been hurt in the first place. And the dark night is all about you getting 
that that whole way of reasoning is absolutely erroneous. That no matter how much you push, you're not going to win this. Now you enter into this darkness that says that whole way of thinking is fundamentally wrong. It's a, it's a level of thinking that goes nowhere because it's based on the deeper level, which is you nurturing self-importance. Because you wouldn't think any of this if you did not think that my will determines God's will for me instead of God's will determining what I do. That I wouldn't be, I wouldn't feel so self-righteous in my view if I didn't think God was behind me. Do you get it now? And that's what is at the heart of the dark night, is that if I didn't think I was so entitled, and I only think I'm entitled because that's what God must have meant for me. And someone screwed up with this plan, and they're going to pay for it because I'm so special. And so you messed with me, you messed with God. And so God's going to help me get you. Yeah. OK? So in that first level of the dark night, you go into darkness because you're actually going into the journey of humbleness. Like this, it can't be that I'm just like everybody else. It can't be. Don't make me face that. Don't make me face that. Please, God, don't make me face that. Don't make me think that I'm like everybody else. Because if I am like everybody else, that I'm not protected from ordinary experiences. Terrible ordinary experiences can happen. I can wake up and I can get diarrhea. And I can wake up and I can be like everybody else. And I can age and, oh my God, please tell me no. Then, then it's just terrible, terrible, terrible. I'll be just like everybody else. Please, please, no. And yes. That's the truth. That's the truth. It's the day that someone looks at you and says, yes, ma'am, and you realize I'm not a young woman anymore. <laughs> OK? And after you finally get over that, and it could take a long time because you got what it takes to put up a fight. And there's nothing more intimidating than this fight because you're really fighting for this idea that if I don't control my life, then I'm out of control of my life. And the greatest delusion is that I have control of my life. And we don't know what it is to give up that control. We don't even know what that means, but we know that that's what this battle's about. So the dark night is really about this battle of, I'm not sure what you're asking me to give up. I have to give up. So what am I giving up here? But it's really about the relinquishing of this attitude that I know what's best for me, but I don't know how to not know what's best. And you're making me crazy. And you're making me crazy. But little by little, what you enter into is this, what am I, who am I angry at? What am I angry at? What is scaring me? What's scaring me is I'm not sure how I'm going to be safe. What does that mean? I have to, you have to take the threads apart one at a time and realize that because I'm not sure about my safety, I make these types of, I make these types of choices. OK, if I, if I said, what do you want me to do? If I rely on you instead of my gut, instead of my fear, would I make a different kind of choice? If I said in this moment, are you talking to me? Do you want me to do something else? Would I choose something else if I trusted in this moment? Instead of fear that keeps me living in this tiny house, would I actually hear you say, leave, go. I want you to move, and I want you to just ex go on a spiritual sojourn and walk about. 
go. I'll meet you there. Dare I even think I heard that? Dare I even think I heard such a thing? Do, do you understand? You think, I would never have chosen that. That's right, you wouldn't. Now go. You think, that can't be me, but it is. You think, I, I'm doing something unreasonable. That's right, because you are beyond reason now. You're totally out of reason. You're out of the radio range of your reason. And now you're in the mystic range where you cannot reason. And when someone says to you, what's your reason for this? You don't have one. You're finally in the unreasonable range. You're out. You have no idea what you're doing, except that you're following something that, like the Old Testament, you'll get manna per day as you wander this desert. Manna was not given for a week and a head. It was as needed. As needed. Because that's the only, and here you have to understand the reasoning of God. Anytime you're given too much, what do you do? Slow down? No, okay, that's one. Get, that's right, you get comfortable. What else do you do? Hoard, that's very good. And what else do you do? See how you misbehave? What? Stop, stop listening. That's good. See how you misbehave? <laughs> That's it. And you start developing expectations. You start anticipating and expectations, and you screw up your own trip. If I show you too much of the map, you start deciding where you're going to go. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I wouldn't dare show you where you're going tomorrow, because then you decide what time you're getting up, where you're going, and what you're going to wear. I wouldn't even consider it. I'll give you the map when you get up and you go. And you have to spontaneously act from your soul every step of the way and discover, I am so quick on the draw. I'm capable. I have to decide in the moment which direction to go. I have to hunch it out. I have to rely on my instincts. And guess what? I made it to the end of the day. And not only that, I feel damn good about myself. And not only that, I discovered things because I didn't project, because I didn't anticipate. And no one disappointed me because I didn't say, you're responsible for me. I was responsible for me. And as a result, I'm empowered, not disempowered. And I'm not blaming anybody else for this path I'm walking on. Because I didn't tell anybody else, you're responsible for my life. No, 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 no. That's not how this works. I'm discovering I'm the one that's responsible. See the difference? The dark. And what happens is you find that you become more empowered, and one of the engines you, dis you discover is, I actually have what it takes to, to love people along the way. I don't have to wait for permission. I don't have to wait for, is it OK? Is it OK? It's OK to be fully you. That's the second night. The second part is you realize, I have so many resources in me, and I didn't know that. You didn't know it because you, had to, you were working with this, uh, uh, how to organize your life according to your fears, and you didn't realize it. Every will struggle you have, every power struggle you have with someone, is essentially a power struggle of protection, which is why I hope you lose all of them. Every one of them is one of protection, to protect you from being humiliated, to protect you from whatever. You are protecting yourself from something. And if you weren't frightened, you wouldn't be in the struggle. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The last one I want to just give you is miracle. Miracle is a holy word, and you need to have that one at your beck and call at all times. 
And one of the prayers you should feel free to say all the time is, I need a miracle now. And what a miracle is, is divine intervention faster than Kronos time. It happens in Kairos. Like, I get here fast and do something. That's your prayer. Get here fast and do something. And then don't go being an ordinary mortal and looking for proof. Faith, the, 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 thing, the power in faith and trust is that you just have to trust something is taking place. But don't put yourself at the center of the answer of every one of your prayers. You're not the star. You understand me? You're not, you're not the recipient of every one of your prayers. You're not this. Get out of the way. Just say, download some grace here. Help out. Do something. We need some help. We need a miracle. Something on the fast track will be just nice. Something on the fast track. Much appreciated. And then just get up in the morning and say, surround me with grace. We're off. We're off to work. Bless everybody as I see them. Off you go. Live in this field of grace. Live in it. Breathe it. Remember, everybody else is living in a field of grace. Amateurs call it energy. They don't know what they're talking about. We are connected by grace. Now, do you have any last questions? Yeah, yeah, honey. Wait, remember Beth with the magic microphone. Who is talking? Where are my bones? Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted you to confirm what the trilogy is with forgive, forgiveness. You said that the holy words forgive was part of a trilogy. Well, they go with... <coughs> they go with, um, <coughs> oh my God, um, sin and evil and forgiveness. Okay. You really do need to look at the, the way darkness talks to you because it will always tell you, and you could throw in ego, because it will always tell you that you have the right to stay angry. Well, <coughs> we'll always tell you the other person is wrong. I need some water. We'll always, always tell you that. We'll always make the other person, we'll always tell you that, that forgiveness is saying what they did was okay and how terrible that is. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is this wild, mystical act that is fully unreasonable. If you ever want to do something unreasonable, go think, do I have anything to forgive? And go forgive. And it is, I'm sorry, no, no. It is a terribly unreasonable thing to do. And it's terribly difficult. Because some things are so horrible. And that's true too. And that's where you really, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're that, if, if the pain in us is that deep, that's where you have to reach to your soul companions. And you have to say, pray with me. I need, to, I need to forgive, but I am not ready. But I need to get there, because it just hurts too much. And that's when you just say, God, get me ready to forgive. I need, I need out of this. I need out of this. And at least start praying for the balm to come in. I promise you it'll happen. I promise you. And what you dwell on in your prayers is that, that healing balm and not them. Get your eyes off the person you're angry at. Stop dwelling on them. Stop dwelling on wanting to make them acknowledge what they did. At least get your eyes off that. What else? Anything else? Yes, my darling. You talked about, there's a paradox you said. You said God is not random, and then just earlier you said we we're talking about Teresa of Avila says God is chaos. And could you it's talk right. to chaos that paradox? Chaos isn't random. Okay. 
Got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, chaos is not random at all. There's a pattern to it. Divine chaos. When you you, you think um, weather is very chaotic, but chaotic, but it has a pattern to it. And and chaos in your life, we create chaos, but it's often patterned. It's because uh oh, there goes the temper again. Uh oh, there goes this again. Uh oh, there goes that again. And even when even when there's change in our life, um, even when there's change in our life, you think there is um, when you feel the cycle of death and rebirth come, you can sense it's there are endings and beginnings, and they're always chaotic because look, we fight that. But at a symbolic level, you know, it's ending and beginning time. And we, f we can feel it. We can feel it. It's time. And so it's going to create chaos because it's so difficult to let go. And in that in between the end and the beginning, we feel like we're free floating in the universe because we haven't yet fully connected to the new. That, in a sense, is where we are right now in this great cosmic moment in time. We're between the new pattern and the old. We're the, at the end of the, we're ending the fossil era and we're beginning the solar, but we are neither at the full end or the full beginning. But we know this era is coming to a close, the era of being earth people, and we're beginning to be solar people. We're the end of being five sensory and the beginning of being multi, but we're not fully five sensory anymore and we're not fully multi. We, we, we are aware of our energy anatomy system, but we don't legitimize it in the medical schools. You don't go for a medical treatment and you're still, they draw blood and urine, but they don't do anything about your energy system. And yet you know, you know you have an energy anatomy system, but they don't teach it as they should. So we are neither fully in the energy health, but we know we're more than chemical. So we are neither this nor that. You know that you have multiple sensory system. You know when you walk in a room you sense things, but you do it conveniently. You'll go someplace and you'll say, oh, I can't be in a crowd, but you're totally fine walking down streets in this, and you do nothing to protect yourself, nothing. You do nothing ahead in the morning to acknowledge, I am a sensitive being, I am in an electromagnetic field. If you just want to talk mechanics, you do nothing, nothing whatsoever to ensure that, you're not, that you are not porous when you walk out the streets. You do not come home and evaluate yourself and think, what kind of choices have I made? Am I hemorrhaging anywhere? Have I anchored myself any place? Am I draining? That's like, that's like seeing whether or not you've cut yourself and you're bleeding on the street every night. So you can talk about your energy system, but you do nothing, 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 nothing at all. But you think eating vegetables compensates for that. You're crazy. You are absolutely crazy. You'd be much better off eating cat food and cheeseburgers and, and managing your energy system well. But you don't. That's why nobody's healthier. You're not any healthier. People in the 50s were much healthier than you are. You guys are on drugs and medication and this and you're in therapy and this and that. You're not healthier than my grandparents and parents were. You're, you're, hyper, bye. you're hypersensitive and toxic and over the edge and depressed and God knows what. Good night, darling. But, but this is all from not getting how to manage your energy systems and who you really are. But people instead compensate, but I think I'll eat more salmon. You don't get it. You don't get it. You are spiritual beings. And you could talk about you. We have to live it. We have to live it. This, this is our moment now. This is our moment. We are governed by 
a holy system. However you want to address that system. And the system is two things. It is fully intimate and it's fully impersonal. This is a system of law, mystical law. And the law comes through us. It's a complete law of creation. It works in the physical as science and in the divine and in the soul as mystical. As you think, so you think you create. And if you don't think you need prayer to help govern your wisdom and manage the power that's you, you better think again. There isn't a therapist in the world that has the wisdom of, your whole, of, of holy light. You have to understand, you are a powerful spiritual being. And, and, and for your own sake, recognize you are a holy being. And everything you do matters. Everything you say matters. How you treat everybody matters. We are one holy, ecological, interconnected system of life. I think that's incredible. I think that's unbelievable. All life breathes together. Thank you.